Hey friends, and welcome to the Happy Hour with Jamie Ivy Podcast. I am your host, Jamie, and I am so excited that you are here. Each week, I invite a girlfriend to join me on the show, and we chat about the big things in life, the little things in life, and everything in between. Today's guest is my friend Kirsten Dickerson. Kirsten started Raven and Lily by combining her passions for social justice and fashion. Raven and Lily is a socially conscious lifestyle brand dedicated to empowering women through design. Kirsten and her filmmaker husband and their two kids live in a tiny house in the country outside of Austin, Texas on Green Acres, which is a boutique retreat for artists and families. They have a minimalist lifestyle and are enthusiasts of slow food and slow fashion and the positive impact they have on people around the planet. I actually this week went to Kirsten and her family's house. It is like 30 minutes outside of Austin. It is beautiful. It's called Green Acres. And we saw a concert by John Foreman. It was so beautiful and wonderful. Their house out there, they have an Airstream and a yurt that you can actually rent through Airbnb. And I'm going to put the link up on jamieivy.com. And they have a second yurt that's going to be up by October 1st. And so they have these two yurts and the Airstream you can rent. It's going to be featured in two upcoming magazines here in Texas. A great one here in Austin and one in Dallas. And one magazine actually features the top three romantic places in the Hill Country to visit. So that's fun. Today's show, we discuss what led her and her husband to move out to the country, what that life looks like for them. We talk about the shows we are binging on as families and how ethical fashion should impact what our closets look like. I want to say thank you to someone who left a comment over on iTunes, a review of the show. Guys, thank you so much. Every time you leave a comment or a review or a rating, it helps more people find the show. So like last week when I got so high in the ratings over on iTunes, it's because so many people were leaving um, reviews and ratings and subscribing. So thanks a lot, guys. Julie Girl 445 said this at the end of last month. She said, I overheard a friend mention this to someone a few weeks ago and haven't stopped listening since. It's been exactly what my heart has needed as God has been opening my eyes to some hard truths about who I am and how he wants to grow me. The interviews are inspiring, hilarious, and so fun. Thank you so much, Jamie. Well, Julie, thank you so much for listening. That is so sweet. Okay, guys, here's the deal. The Happy Hour podcast is growing, and it is so wonderful and so fun for me to hear from you. And there are a lot of people out there that are listening, and I really cannot even begin to tell you how honored I am that you choose to spend part of your day with me and my guest on the Happy Hour. Because of that, I want to get to know you guys, and specifically, I want to get some feedback on what you guys think of the show. So I've set up a survey just to do that. It's super easy. Go to jamieivy.com slash survey to see it. It will take you literally like four minutes to fill it out. And I would really, really appreciate it. It's just 15 questions. And filling it out gives you a chance to win a $25 gift card from Amazon. Personally, from me to you. So it's just a way to say thank you. It's super easy to do that. jamieivy.com slash survey. Today's sponsor for the happy hour is Warriors Pie Haven in Round Top, Texas. And if you visit anywhere close to Austin or Houston or San Antonio, you need to make a stop in Round Top. The antique fair is coming up, and they do that like twice a year. But Royer's is there, and it's a very famous, um, it's a very fam- famous cafe. And when guests would come just to eat pie out at Royer's Round Top Cafe, they would have to offer it to go or to eat on the front porch. So there became this opportunity for the Royer's Pie Haven. It's a place for overflow, a place for guests to grab an amazing cup of coffee along with a slice of pie or even a whole pie in a relaxing, inviting, and inspiring atmosphere. It's like a sanctuary. The Pie Haven offers other sweet and savory treats and even savory pies. Perfect for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They have two locations, one in Round Top, which is about an hour and 15 minutes outside of Austin, and then one in Austin. You can look them up on warriorspiehaven.com. And get this, guys. If you go into Warriors Pie Haven, either in Round Top or in Austin, and tell them that you heard an ad on the happy hour, you buy a slice of pie, and they'll give you a slice of pie for free. So tell me that's not a fun date night. Walk in and get two for one on a slice of pie. Thanks, Royers Pie Haven, for sponsoring this episode of the Happy Hour. Oh, they're pets. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's what I was wondering. Because you know, like, people have, like, I don't know, <laughs> cows and pigs, and eventually they're like, you know, like Charlotte's Web. Wilbur did go to the market, you know, so I, know. I didn't know. I think most people do that. I'm just like, we need cute animals. When people come visit us, it just makes them smile. And so... Okay, and so let's, just, press, let's so. just jump right in here because this is one of the main things I want to talk to you about. First of all, thanks for coming on the happy hour. Of course. I've been trying to have you on forever. And let me just tell you, where do your kids go during the summer? Well, they're in year-round school. So they're still in school. They have like another um, week and a half. Okay, so, so they, we're in year-round school, but we must be on different schedules or our year-rounds must be different interpretations. Yes, because we, it's a private school. They go to Acton Academy. Okay. When and do they so, get a summer break? 
They get a summer break mid-July to the end of August, and then every six weeks during the year for every session, they get one or two weeks off. So okay. that's how their year-round works. And then the summer, they do apprenticeships with their schools. So my son will be doing an apprenticeship with the film project. Mm-hmm. And then we they both go to Lady Lodge Youth Camp. Mm-hmm. And then we are going to California to do a road trip from Berkeley, where we first got married and Mason was born all the way down to L.A., where we lived and was May Lee's first house when we first adopted her. So we're going to do like a California road trip with the kids, and then I'm speaking at the Yellow Conference. We're going to end it at that. That sounds so fun. We took our kids to Tennessee this summer and then last summer, but last summer we like made this out-of-the-way trip to go show um, our first home that we had as a family, and that's where – um, nice. Caden was already born. He was a couple weeks old, but that's where Deacon came home to. It's where we started our adoption of Amos and Story. And we took our kids by the house. And I expect, I had these expectations of the excitement that would come from the kids and they would want to know stories and they would want to get out and take pictures. <laughs> they could care less. I, I asked so, I wanted a picture so badly and no one would. And by this time in the trip, Aaron didn't even like enforce it. He was like, Jamie, no, they don't want to. Like, I mean, it was just so anticlimactic for me. I on that trip. I remember seeing photos on your Instagram or something. It was just yeah. like. We're, we're visiting friends and doing, like, you know, these are like, uh-huh. we're doing things, but you know, it actually, I think it could, like my son could care less really, you know, but. I, honestly, May Lee's the one that said, can we go visit all the places I lived in L.A.? Isn't uh-huh. that uh-huh. It's different homes. We're like, okay, we'll try to fit that in. <laughs> sure. It's like the Stars tour trip that people take, except you're taking, like, the home trip of where we lived, you know? So it's great. But it's like the Stars tour trip because where we lived was always – next to stars and so it's pretty funny that so is funny lived in LA. oh yeah it's pretty like snoop dogg lived above us in one of our homes it was pretty funny okay so that's that's a story right there I, <laughs> I mean let's just shut everything else down and tell me about this <laughs> well we planted a church in hollywood for a while i don't know if you knew that no. it's called, called ecclesia hollywood it was on um, hollywood boulevard on the walk of fame and when it brandon was still directing film at the time and um we were just um, starting a church with friends, and he has he's ordained, but he was not planning to use that in like an official pastoring role or anything. Okay, wait, stop. I'm sorry to interrupt. For just yeah. a second, I thought you meant that Snoop Dogg was ordained. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I was like, oh my gosh, I need to know a lot more about this. Yeah, he might, for all we know. <laughs> okay, Brandon was ordained. I got it. I'm, can- I'm going with you now. So Brandon, Brandon's ordained. Most people didn't know that. He's, he's mostly at this point in his career doing like music videos for Disney stars, mm-hmm. like the Jonas Brothers and Demi Lovato and all these people. And then he's doing commercials. So it's paying the bills. But his right. passion is to be a storyteller and he's really wanting to make movies. But it's actually really hard to do in L.A., which come, comes into our story later, how we end up in Texas. But um, at that time, a group of friends and us, for a long story short, ended up deciding to start a church amongst a group we already had, but didn't really know what we were doing and actually didn't really fully realize we were starting a church, to be honest. And Brandon said, well, I can help out as we start until we can find who should be our pastor. So it was really just like five couples saying, let's do this. Mm -hmm. Long story short, everybody loved Brandon speaking so much. We called him the reluctant pastor because for two years, he ended up being the lead pastor, but he created a pastor posse is what he called it so that he could still be directing and have like others that would help out with the right. piece. Uh-huh. And then he finally threw in the towel and realized he really had to step out of directing and just embrace like this church was taking off and we were meeting in this theater on Hollywood Boulevard and he was a full-time pastor for two years. It was during that time, you know, obviously going from a career that he had to being a pastor was mm-hmm. a financial change. So we sold our home that was in an area of LA called Silver Lake and moved into the heart of Hollywood, into the first kind of fancy modern condo building that had been built and what was falling apart Hollywood. Like Hollywood was beautiful back in the heyday of the, you know, 50s and that sort of thing. And then it kind of fell apart. And then we were there during this kind of revitalization when we started this church. But when you would walk out of our church, you would usually run into a lot of um, prostitutes and homeless and tourists and a little bit of everything all mixed uh-huh. in there. A lot of street kids. It was like definitely not what people think of as Hollywood. Right. We moved into the corner of Sunset and Vine into this kind of modern condo. And because it was the first, there was a really interesting mix of people 
that had all decided to embrace this revitalization of Hollywood. We were, to my knowledge, the only Christians and the only family living in this place. Hence and the Snoop Dogg living above you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Above us. And below us was Nicole, this homeless woman that slept on, she was 65 and slept in a white plastic chair below our apartment under the light every day, which later we helped her get into permanent housing, which was a really cool experience for our kids because they prayed for her every night. Uh. And then eventually asked to go meet her. I mean, it was just a crazy experience. But my highlight was that I got mail for Chris Martin for a long time because he used to live in the apartment that we were Like in. Chris Martin Coldplay? Yeah. Hilarious. <laughs> and so it was really funny. I seen the cake was like this letter from his mom one time. And I was like, I really got to contact his record company. So I eventually contacted the record label and was like, I have all this mail for Chris, and now it's mail from his mom. Where do you want me to do this? This just <laughs> got personal. <laughs> it was so funny. So I guess the label, when he was recording an album or something in L.A. Put at some him up point, there. Up there, and it was, you know, it wasn't that old of buildings. It must have just been like six months or so before he moved in, but isn't that funny? That is really funny. I know. And then the other celebrity hilarious thing that I just have to tell you is that after that, I kind of was like, okay, I'm, I'm maxed out. I can't do the concrete jungle anymore. Mm -hmm. And so we, he was still pastoring the church at the time, but we moved into this little area called Studio City that was kind of like an old neighborhood, lots of cute old bungalows. And we moved into this like 1920s Spanish bungalow that was literally around the corner from the Brady and Dutch house. So that was like awesome to like live like five yes. stories out from the Brady Bunch house. That's and hilarious. So, uh, yeah, we went trick or treating there because we were dying to see the interior. But, um, it was a cute old lady that was like uh, so awesome. You know what's but funny? Oh, go ahead. One day, I it was shortly after I had just started the idea of Raven and Lily, my company, and I was I had a studio in the back of this house, and that's why I felt like now's the time to start this idea because I had a space to do it. And I had been back there working on things. The doorbell rang. I was wearing this random Indian tunic. My chihuahua was barking and my bird is chirping. So I picked up the chihuahua and opened the door. And do you know who's standing there? Yeah. It was Britney Spears and Ellen DeGeneres and caroling outfits with this giant film crew behind them. Shut up. And yeah, it was hilarious. They Wait. proceeded to sing me carols to come into my house. I'm on national TV holding a bird and a dog and they're singing to me and doing all this crazy stuff. It was some part of some Christmas special and I have no idea why they picked me and why they came to the house, but it was the craziest, most random thing that ever happened to okay, me. Okay, do you sure. have video footage of this? Oh, it's on YouTube, girl. If you went to, like, I think Googled, um, it's several years old, but they re-aired it this year, so I'm sure it's still there. It's, oh, I'll uh, find like, it. I think it's Ellen and Brittany caroling part two. Yeah. <laughs> you can't miss the girl with the short blonde hair carrying a dog and a chihuahua in it. You will not miss it. It's okay. worth watching. It's really embarrassing and funny. And I totally did not want to sign the release for it, but I knew my husband would never forgive me, forgive me if he didn't get a chance to, you know, witness That's what true. I went through. So I agreed on his behalf. <laughs> did they ask you to sign the release after? Yeah. <laughs> okay. They're like, let me put you through all of this and then please let us put it on national TV. Oh my gosh, Jamie, there was a point where all these elves were in my house. They brought me a Christmas oh tree. Oh my gosh. They wrapped it in a 25 foot scarf. <gasps> they, sent, they turned a get a blaster on, and, and Brittany and Ellen sang Womanizer to me. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was the funniest thing ever. Oh my gosh. If people showed up at my house some days without me knowing, I mean, it. <laughs> First of all, some days, especially in the summer with all my kids home, it looks like someone came in and robbed us and left in like in a hurry. You know what I mean? That kind of look in your house. And then like we swim all the time. I'd have like swim hair and nasty no, clothes. Totally I'm in this like Indian tunic because I was just at home working all day. So it was very funny to me. Oh that my is. gosh. Hilarious. Okay. Speaking of the Brady Bunch, recently I was like, I want to get a show that we can all watch together and like binge watch it you know you know i love binge watching netflix after the kids go to bed and so i'm like what can i watch that would be appropriate for an 11 year old and a seven year old and oh, yeah. i could come up with nothing but i came up with the brady bunch and so oh my gosh brandon like forces us to watch old shows and you know what our newest one is that the kids loved what i we have these two new alpacas that we bought uh -huh. and i decided to name them laverne and shirley because oh. one is a redhead and one is a brunette and they are funny they're like just random funny animals. And so the kids are like, who's Laverne and Shirley? So last week we introduced them to Laverne and Shirley, and it still delivers. It's pretty funny. So, 
I thought might consider that as well. Okay, I'm gonna add it to the list because I thought I'm gonna put this on and they're gonna be like, Mom, this is so dumb. They kept requesting it and wanting to watch more and more, and so I'm like, Okay, I can go with this. I have not done the Brady Bunch yet. I should because the kids they watched it like a long time ago when we lived there, but it's like one episode just they could mm-hmm. appreciate the house. And oh so yeah. Like, like I out. wanted to put it on the other day for just a few of them. They're like, wait. Everyone's not here. They're going to miss it. And I'm like, oh, my gracious, y'all are in this. And so that's our new thing, the Brady Bunch. That's awesome. I'm proud of them. Which is so funny. Yes. Um, Okay, I want to talk about your new living quarters. Yes. I want to know everything because everything I know is just from what I've seen in pictures. Okay, I know. Fill me in. We keep it going here and out, but it hasn't worked out. So I one know. of these days, your family's going to have to come on yes. over. Yes. So you went to our, our old house that we used to live at. Yes. Off of South Lamar. Mm-hmm. So what happened is... Um, Which, by the way, when we had dinner with y'all, my kids still talk about how sweet your boy was to them. Oh, I love that. Like when they... Like Amos just got a skateboard for his birthday, and he remembered like playing in y'all's driveway. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, I love it. We had, didn't we have a half pipe then? I think we, I we had it then. That's why he probably remembers probably it. Probably. Have... Yeah. <laughs> you kid. should come. It's on the land now. That was the first thing we did. Boys will but, never forget that. Yeah. Well, we'll have to have you guys out. We would love it. So we um, basically, we were living in that house, which is like a modern condo. We loved it. Everything was great. But we were longing for the ability to be able to retreat and unplug. And when we lived in California... That was something Bray and I regularly did. We lived five years in Berkeley and eight years in L.A. before we moved to Austin. We've been here five. So we've been married over 18 years. And in Berkeley and L.A., so during those 13 years, we would regularly find, like, a monastery or a nunnery or a little um, retreat place that we would go away for, like, one or two nights on a regular basis just to pray about things, to think about things, to even do like a silent retreat. There was a variety of reasons to write, whatever it might be. And um, after we moved to Austin, we realized that wasn't really something on people's radar and we hadn't really found a place like that. Mm-hmm. Um, we'd heard of you know people going to Marfa, a place like that, but that's right. like eight hours away. I and mean, we're yeah. talking, what's something when you have kids that you can just go away for a night for 24 hours? You no, know, it's so true because you, you know, know what, Kirsten? Aaron goes away. He's, he's a person that he craves solitude. Like, mm-hmm. I don't get that. I, if you told me I had to go be by myself for a weekend, I literally would start crying. Um, (laughs) He craves it. And in fact, if he is like a a stressful season and he's like not being a good husband, a good dad, a good worker, whatever, I'm always like, you need to be alone. Like this, it takes a toll on him. And you know, you know where he goes? Marfa. So is that Benny? And he loves it, but I'm always, and and it's confusing to me because I'm like, it's eight hour drive for a weekend. You're going to be there for like 48 hours. So yeah. So I hear you. Go on. Well, so that's kind of something we were thinking about. And really, this is more driven by Brandon than even me. But I am a nature freak. And so I honestly most experience God's presence when I'm serving the poor and I'm in his creation in nature. And that's like how I feel the most sense of connection and worship. And it's all, I've always been wired that way. It's part of the reason I think I felt led to start Raven and Lily a long time ago and why we decided to do what we did. But we for kind of the reasons of like feeling the call of the wild in nature. And Brian and I, I don't know, we've moved like 10 times in our marriage. So we're not really attached to things or a place. We're just attached to each other as a family. Mm-hmm. And we both felt this calling and said to our kids, like, let's, let's do something. And um, we went to the Pine Cove family retreat over Thanksgiving. Yes. And that same week also went to this random safari it's not there anymore, but this lady had a mansion in Bernie that she would open up and in her backyard were like giraffes and stuff. Okay. And we were like, that was awesome. What if we did our own version of these two things combined? You know, something You're like that- Pine Cove plus African Safari. <laughs> <laughs> that is, yes. And so that's, hence you have Green Acres for us today. But we um, just started dreaming and praying. And um, shortly after Brian and I started, this was like in November. And in December and January, we started looking into land. Like, what would be within a half hour of Austin? What would it be like to buy land? And Brandon was like, in California, only the wealthy would own land. Mm-hmm. Like, it was just like a crazy idea to him that we could own land. He's like, I'm in Texas. I could own land. So, this, granted, this man drives a Mini Cooper. Today, he drives <laughs> a big old Ford F-150. So, the van has gone through quite a change. That's in the last hilarious. Year. 
But we found this property east of Austin and, and Elgin, that kind of at the edge of Weberville, Bastrop, and Elgin. Uh-huh. It's honestly, if you were to like drive catty corner through our property, you'd hit Lost Pines. Okay. So we're really close to I that. Love Lost but Pines. There's no way to get there from, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like yeah. if you look at the map, if you have to go all the way around, but that's kind of the okay. area we are. It's just like, it, it's real beautiful. Lots of trees and very beautiful. Um, it's hilly. And we loved it because most people buy kind of more in the hill country or, uh-huh. or other areas. But we, our kids' school's on the east side, and um, I decided that I was going to move my Raven Lily studio and open up a storefront near the kids' school. And so we knew it had to be east of there. And eventually Brandon moved his film office over there. And we found this property, and we loved it. And we bought it over two years ago, but we just really sat on it for almost a year and um, we would just camp out there, and we put the half pipe that your son likes to right. hang out on. We put that was the first thing we did on the land. So, like you know, our priorities are there. So we yes. put our half pipe there, and we just tried to figure out like we didn't have a lot of extra resources, so we kind of put all our money into buying this land, mm-hmm. and then we just started renting an apartment here on the east side near the kids' school in my store, and. As we had money, we bought a 1955 Spartan Mansion, which is an old vintage trailer, and we renovated that and put that on the property. And then a year ago, we bought this yurt that's kind of like a Turkish canvas yurt Mm -hmm. and built a deck and then eventually decorated that, but that wasn't finished until like last November. And... um, we decided, you know, we we were we wanted to build a home. We were waiting to see if we could save up for that, and we decided that's going to be a while for us. But our kids are getting older. My son's turns fifteen this summer, and Maylee's eleven and a half, and we want to experience whatever this is supposed to be together. Mm-hmm. And we want to be able to start sharing this beautiful property that we found. And it's twenty five acres, and um, we just decided on Thanksgiving week last year to just move out there. And the week we decided to do that, I went online and Craigslist and found an Airstream for our son. And so we bought him an Airstream. This is hilarious. <laughs> I know. And so his bedroom is an Airstream. It's kind of equivalent as if he walks upstairs, but he literally just has to walk outside. Right. And take, so it's pretty hilarious. But he has his Airstream next to our Spartans. They're two silver vintage trailers. They have decks. And um, next to that is this yurt we have that was our has been our guest house, and now we've had an ongoing rotation of people that come to retreat there. Okay, I'm going to need a few explanations real quick before we go yeah. on. When you say yurt, I know what it is, but I think a lot of people listening will not know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. It's like a big teepee almost. Well, this one, so a traditional yurt that most people think of would be a Mongolian yurt. They're quite thick and insulated. They're circular, they're kind of flat on the top, uh-huh. and that's like their traditional home. This year is more like a safari tent meets a teepee. Okay. Because it's pointed. So it almost looks like a Hershey Kiss. Okay. But it's waterproof. I've had guests stay in there during lightning storms and in the harsh winter, and people are staying there right now even though it's hot. Like, it cracks me up. But it has a queen bed in there. It's all decorated with things that I've picked up from so cute. India, Morocco, Pakistan. Okay, here comes the dumb question. <laughs> yeah. Is there any air or heat? We have fans in there during the summer, okay. and in the winter we put space heaters in there. Okay. So I think if it's, like, super extreme, like, we're going to not, like, rent it out in August, and we won't probably rent it out, like, in January. You okay. know, like, it's super extreme months, but mm-hmm. otherwise... It's open, and we have this barn that they say belonged to LBJ, President LBJ. Mm, mm-hmm. We don't know any other details, so we just sort of let that story live on. Brandon always jokes, we're not going to let the truth get in the way of a good story. So. All right, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we have an LBJ barn for whatever that means, but it's awesome looking. The architecture of it's so cool, and we built this kind of outdoor open-air kitchen and have this long, like, 30-foot table and fans and theater seats and swings and hammocks. And so it's a great communal space, and we share it with our guests. And so we live out there, but we have a regular rotation of strangers, little strangers or our guests that come and stay with us to retreat. And it's been an incredible experience. So we feel like we have this piece of property, and um, we've been adding animals. We have miniature donkeys and alpacas and farm cats and um, we intend to get more and like chickens. It, yeah, we want to get chickens <laughs> and all kinds of things. But really, um, we have forests with trails, and it's really been just a blessing to us. It's been a lot of work because we are such city people. We call it Green Acres because who are we kidding? Right. And sometimes I literally have come home from work and I like 
am so anxious to get out there with the animals and to, to get my hands dirty because I love it so much. I don't even bother to change. So I'll full on have like a silk dress on and Raven Lily jewelry and my, my work boots and I'll be on a tractor and it doesn't even phase me. Hilarious. And somebody takes mention. And one day I realized, am I kind of like that character on the Green Acres <laughs> TV show? <laughs> And I was like, that was not intentional, but it's pretty funny. That's, we need Ellen and Brittany to come back and video that <laughs> is what we need right there. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, we call it Great Acres because it was like, you know, the t- it's very much us, a TV show, but also because it is, it is literally Green Acres. That's what it looks like. We also are living an eco-friendly style. We had to sell 80% of our belongings to make wow. that move last November. And it kind of goes inside with my whole philosophy of life, mm-hmm. of just being intentional as a family and how we live and thoughtful about how the things you do, the things you buy affect other people, affects the planet. Right. And we want to be very thoughtful in that. And so that's something that's been expressed through my company, even through Brandon's film work. But we thought we needed to really take this all the way out. And this is the way we live our lifestyle. So mm-hmm. it's pretty extreme. It and is. It's an experiment, an experiment, but it's been a lot of fun. And um, a lot of fun to share with other people. And we have a big dream to, you know, as we have the resources to add little cabins in the woods and do all kinds of things. My daughter's an aspiring chef, Jamie. Oh. And I love that about her. She wants to open up a restaurant called Treetops and have like tree houses that you can come dine in, which uh, that sounds pretty awesome to me. So maybe does one sound day awesome. Tops the restaurant at Green Acre as that well. That is great. <laughs> yeah, How big is the... I'm going to say house, but it's not a house. How big is the area where you, you three live? Well, I mean, it's like a trailer, right? It's less than 400 square feet. I think it's like 80. <laughs> oh my word. How have your kids adjusted? Well, they have never complained. Okay. It's amazing to me. Honestly, I think that they, they, have, they have learned, they've traveled with us a lot. Mm -hmm. They've learned, they love it when people come visit. Um, they've learned, I think a lot from the moving to not, they're pretty flexible. Yeah. And I, I'm blown away by how well they are doing. And I think my son though, like he doesn't, he wants his airstream to go to college with him. Like, are you kidding? Like to give a a 14 year old his own. I was going to say, let's be honest. He does. He's living the life right now. It totally He's is living it it's up kind of because we, we do let the airstream be rented out. So it's being rented out the next couple of nights. He has to come into the Spartan with us. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we won't do it very often, but you know, somebody was to book several nights and he's like, all right, mom. So he doesn't really complain, but yeah. he's cute about it. That's so, right. um, but yeah, they're, they're great. I honestly think the kids and I are thriving. It's been the biggest challenge for my California husband. You yeah, know? Like, Hollywood comes to Green Acres. Seriously. He's so funny. So That's he's great. he's a uh, he loves it, but I mean he started a blog. Do you know what it's called? No, so tell me. Okay, it's not I don't mean to be offensive, but you know we have these many donkeys and uh-huh. booty escaping all the time and he was having so much drama learning how to like deal with land and septic tanks and it was crazy. And so he started a blog called Stories About My Ass. I love it. <laughs> because he was at, we just thought the name was hysterical because it was inspired by his donkeys. Um, it and is hilarious. <laughs> it's a very heartfelt blog. And when I read it, I can see his pastoring heart coming out mm. and, his and what he's experiencing and the symbolism of everything he's going through. And so I really like it. Okay. Well, I... I'm going to put all these links that we mentioned up on my website because people are listening. Okay. Like, I want to know, but you have links to on Airbnb for your place. Well, there's a website. It's GreenAcresATX.com. Oh, GreenAcresATX.com. I'll put that up for sure. Yeah. And maybe so, people and are coming to Austin. They want to come stay there. You can see the Airbnb from that. Yeah, we actually have a couple driving in from New Orleans tonight to stay with us for five nights. Oh, Isn't fun. that amazing? Yes. Like two artists. They run like an art art gallery for uh-huh. children in New Orleans and do all kinds of like they're super creative people and uh, yeah I'm excited to meet them and hear more of their story and stuff I like that I love that you know I think, it's funny because Aaron and I when we vacation like we love city like New York City is one of our favorite places to go um, but when we go to New York City on like a vacation we don't come home rested I mean you come <laughs> home exhausted right you know because you go non yes. you're up to like three in the morning every night 
Um, not because you're like out late doing nothing. It's because everybody's out till three in the morning. <laughs> um, but we love to vacation um, places that are not very um, touristy and not yeah. a lot of people there. And so I can see how appealing this would be for a couple just wanting to get away. Yeah, I think it is. And I think it's, it's really been cute for me to see that the kids always want to come out and meet whoever comes. Mm-hmm. And um, we try to give people their space, but they see it just as a way to be a blessing and to minister to whoever comes and yeah. just by, by welcoming and caring for people and providing, you know, a place for them to rest and retreat. Yeah. And so, well, I'm yeah. trying to figure out where I can send my kids soon so Aaron and I can come out there and rest and retreat. Yes! <laughs> We'd love it. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Hey guys, we all love Amazon, right? You can get almost anything there from books to groceries to streaming TV shows to bacon scented candles. I don't actually know if you can get bacon scented candles, but I'm assuming you can and I think I would actually like that in my house. Anyhow, there's a great way for you to help support the happy hour just by using Amazon. All you need to do is the next time that you're about to buy something on Amazon, simply go to jamieivy.com slash Amazon first. That link will take you to the Amazon homepage and it gives a small percentage back to the happy hour. It costs you nothing but it helps me tremendously because it allows me to pay for the hosting and all other kinds of fees that are associated with this podcast so that i can give you the show for free so remember jamieivy.com slash amazon type that in buy all the bacon sitting candles that you want maybe send me one as well and that will help support the podcast okay so i love all this green acre stuff but let's talk about raven and lily okay um so tell me a little bit about how raven and lily started Well, my background is in a lot of nonprofit work. So since college, I've been pretty involved. I went to Baylor University um, since 1991. And I say I busted out of the Baylor bubble. I um, Uh took off. Well, basically, I studied. I took the first Baylor in Africa program in 1994. And I studied African literature and world religion in Kenya and just fell in love with Africa. And during that time, I didn't know anybody else that had been to Africa besides the professor that took us. And then came home and had, before I went to Africa, I had felt called to uh, go to the former Soviet Union for a year. So I actually took off of a year of Baylor to go and be part of a ministry that was mentoring and um, encouraging college age and high school age students after the Iron Curtain had fallen. Mm-hmm. So this okay. was in 94. So I went over. I, I, it was crazy because I was like the rush chairman of my sorority the year before. I was like super involved, like Baylor Bowhead. And I'm not exaggerating. I had yeah. like hair that would not even fit on the screen <laughs> if you were looking at me. Like it was huge, blonde, long hair. And I literally wore bows. Like I was a total Baylor Bowhead. When oh, I went to is. Africa, I came home and chopped off my hair. And then I went to Estonia, lived there a year. And you know, to say the least, those two experiences back to back really changed me because yeah. it opened up my worldview. And I think the reason I was feeling like drawn to do those things is that my parents had gotten divorced the year before and my dad had left us. So he was like out of the picture mm-hmm. and my mom, um, neither one of them are living anymore, but my mom during that time had, was going through a very, very, very deep depression. And I, so I just didn't have family and, um, I, we actually were homeless for a while. So there was a summer uh, after my sophomore year that my um, mom uh, was so depressed that she couldn't make decisions. My dad had disappeared on us. And whatever finances he problems he had done, they fell on to us when he officially divorced my mom. We didn't actually even know what he was doing, where he went. It's just like he disappeared, divorced her. And then all of his finances, because they had joint tax returns, went mm-hmm. on us. And then we had to file bankruptcy. And we literally one time, and little Katie opened up our home and sold all of our belongings, packed up a U-Haul, and drove from Texas to Pennsylvania to move in with my aunt, who had wow. nowhere to go. Mm. So it's really traumatic. Yeah. You know, and I look back on it, and, and it was really traumatic on my sister at the time. She's thriving now, but that, that really was hard on her and my mom. And um, I had to, like, make all these decisions for the families. I think I had been playing such a strong role as a family caregiver that I had gained a lot of independence mm-hmm. and I, um, and for whatever reason that following year I was just feeling so curious about what God was doing in the world and I had I did okay as traumatic as that was and God ended up providing for my sister and I to go back to Baylor through an anonymous 
scholarship. So it was wow. really cool how we got to go back. And I worked like three jobs at Baylor. I was say, Baylor's I, not cheap, so. It's not, no. Yeah. And I, it's amazing to me that I got the education I did. Mm -hmm. There would be times when I couldn't afford food and my roommates from college would just go put food on my shelf. And like, I would never be able to go to the dances because I couldn't afford to buy anything. Yeah. And they would, they would buy me a dress and put it in my closet. I mean, wow. I just had beautiful friends. They're still my closest friends in the world. So they became my family during that time. Mm -hmm. And I think because of them always there to pray over me as I was going through that and just to be there for me, I really thrived. And I really grew so deep in my relationship with God and really was able to see that I could have pure pure joy, mm -hmm. even when I face trials of many kinds. And my faith was really tested, but I feel like it was refined and I had peace and that gave me this courage to want to go see what God was doing in the world. And so long story short, from that moment on is when I started doing these things like the Bayo in Africa program. Mm -hmm. I, a group called Mission Waco had started that year and I was one of the first volunteers with Mission Waco and I lived with a family for a while that started that ministry and the year after I graduated from Baylor, I went to India with them. Wow. The day after. And I spent the summer volunteering with Mother Teresa and Compassion International. And so, again, another experience that just completely changed my worldview. Yeah. And I was drawn to do these things because I just felt like there was something God was wanting me to see and understand. And, boy, howdy. I can see now that all of that, like the loss of my family mm -hmm. and then the, the, the drive to see the world and what God taught me, it, it all kind of started to just shape my worldview in a really profound way. Mm -hmm. And I was, nobody around me was really asking the questions or doing, seeing the things that I was seeing because it wasn't common at that time right. to do that. And so what I started doing for 20 years since like 1996 is I started organizing cross-cultural trips for people to join me. Yeah. It started in Berkeley and then it happened with our church in LA. And, um, I would just invite people to come and to firsthand see some of these nonprofits that I had built relationship with in Africa and in Asia. We even like one time took our son to China with us on a cross-cultural exchange. It was really honestly, you know, not just that, but we went over, um, and uh, he was with us, and it was during that trip we decided to adopt from China. Mm -hmm. And so we adopted Mei Li. It was probably uh, two and a half years we had her after that trip. But the idea came from that, that yeah. uh, cross-cultural trip. So we, you know, it was honestly mostly connected with churches. I was the director of missions for a lot of different churches. I was the director for various nonprofits. So it's kind of something a lot of people don't realize about my background. But I was very involved in a lot of work because – I had learned so much and really genuinely just wanted to share yeah. those experiences with people and connect to them. And it was on a trip in 2007, I took 10 people from Hollywood with me to India to visit three nonprofits that I had a really great relationship with. One was the International Justice Mission in Mumbai, mm -hmm. one was Sneha in a slum community in northern India, and one was a ministry to the Garwali people in the Himalayan mountains. So very three, three different groups. And on that trip, I saw this trend of training women in skills. All three nonprofits were doing that. They were all making design oriented things like jewelry or sewing something. So this idea was there that, you know, these women need, they, most of them can't, were not educated. They had no opportunity. And if you're going to rescue a woman, a young girl, actually, these are like teenagers out of the brothels, but not equip her with a viable job opportunity, she's not going to have any other options. And so you know, they were trying to figure out what to do with that. And then in the slum community, they realized if, you know, you equip the women, they're going to be the ones that invest in their family and right. use kids at school. So a lot of these things we talk about today, but this was in 2007. You know, this was eight, eight years ago, and it was kind of the new, uh, Muhammad Yunus's book had just come out. It was kind of on the new idea of microfinance and microenterprise training. And so I was seeing it firsthand. And because it was design oriented, I got really excited. So while I did all this nonprofit work, you know, during uh, my marriage to my husband, because he was doing film, he was always asking me on the side to be his art director or his stylist mm -hmm. for his videos. So it was a lot of fun. He saw that creative design side of me. And so when we lived in um, the Bay Area and then LA, I chose based on the project if I wanted to do art direction or styling and do it for a lot of famous people and different bands and it was a lot of fun and I think it really challenged me 
to figure out what my creative side was and to really express it in unique ways. And I really had a supportive husband in that. So when I was on this trip in 2007 with these friends from Hollywood and saw these women learning design skills, I got excited because I had all these connections in the design world and I saw like what could be. What they were making honestly was not anything I would normally wear or buy. It was just the idea. And so I went back and talked to a lot of my friends in the design community and asked if they'd be willing to, you know, volunteer with me for a year to figure out what it would look like if we came alongside these groups to help collaborate with them, to give them design input and try to create a market for their goods. Because they didn't have any design input. They had no market. They just had this idea, you know, training Uh them. And eventually in the course of that year, the idea for Raven and Lily was born. We could empower women through design by um, coming alongside these nonprofit efforts and really kind of taking those initial um, ideas to equip and empower the women to the next level, to be their cheerleaders and say, I believe in what you're doing. We want to be a part of this holistic care you're offering, these women, these children, these families, because every group was dedicated to making sure these women and families had educational opportunities, had access to health care. We're in a loving, caring environment. And so we would come alongside that and then help them turn in that into a sustainable business model that could be sustainable income for the women and truly empowering, offering dignity and hope because they're making something that was right. beautiful, high quality, scalable that people wanted to buy. And that just in turn was bringing them honor and dignity and yeah. all the designs we would design to the skills of the women utilizing the local eco-friendly resources. Mm-hmm. But I really wanted it to be on par with fashion forward, um, you know, mainstream things yeah. from the beginning. I didn't want it to look crafty. I didn't want it to look like traditional fair trade. Right. Um, so it was, it was a challenge. We were a nonprofit for the first um, like three years. And then when my family decided to move to Austin in 2011, Ravenly moved into a social business model. Mm-hmm. And then in 2013, we became a B Corp, a benefit corp, which means we're for profit, but we exist for public benefit. And our public benefit is to empower impoverished women and provide ethical fashion for our customers. And we give back to all of our um, partnerships. But my main mission is to make sure that we are sustaining our efforts to currently employ well over 1,000 women in eight different countries. In so 15- wonderful different partnerships so yeah I love it it's been growing it started with like just a couple of groups and it's grown to a lot and kind of figuring it out as we go along and really now like nobody mentioned the word ethical fashion when I started so it's Mm -hmm. really exciting that that's kind of a more common term now because just like slow food is so um you know mainstream now compared to 10 years ago it's the idea farm to table I've always believed that if Austin was such a um you know in this certain communities were really supportive of farm to table that they would be supportive of other areas Mm -hmm. like what you wear to start to ask those hard questions of who made my clothes and how are they made and if I can provide a solution and then also be mentoring other people with similar like-minded country companies that were emerging in this you know community and in other cities that that's that's going to be what you know changes things as as there are options and choices and I do believe that people will want to choose something that they know can honor people in the planet. Yeah. I think that um, you're totally right about that. I think, what would you say to someone that's listening that's like, yes, I want to make those choices. I want that. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. I think it, it honestly requires some time. Like I think if you, um, you could start, Oh, sorry. My earphones fell out. You can start with um, bcorporation.net. And okay. that's, um, that's a list of all kinds of companies, whether it's fashion or Ben and Jerry's or seventh generation. I mean, companies uh-huh. that are thoughtful, that go through the highest level of audit. We go through an intense audit every two years that looks at and evaluates and grades every area of our company to say that we are doing what we say we do. Gotcha. So it's a big deal. We actually won an award this year for being one of the world's top companies for um, community impact which was a huge deal. That is huge, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it, it means a lot to me because it was an incredible, it's like not an understatement, an incredible amount of work. Like we follow fair trade and above fair trade standards, but it only speaks to one aspect of what we do. And so I didn't want it to just be that we're fair trade. I want it to be that we are so much more. And so the bcorporation.net can give you all kinds of companies and read about their ethical commitment. And it's really a great resource. But That's great. 
In addition, the Ethical Fashion Forum, based in London, is a big resource of all different kinds of fashion companies. Mm -hmm. And then I've written a blog on our Wit Ravenly website that lists my favorite companies that you can look at. And honestly, in Austin, it's amazing. You have so many companies like Tasha, Fortress of Inca, Raven and Lily, New Day Collection. I mean, the amount of companies that are based here that are socially conscious that were not here when I started. So in yeah. five years, it is so exciting to me. So what I had hoped would happen is happening. And it's really, I think, great because Austin's such a strong city now. And it is a cultural influence on our country. And I do think that all these emerging social businesses and ethical companies are just going to grow and, and you're going to get to see more and more of them out there. Okay. You have a lot of great stuff on your blog. I mean, you have the, Thanks. your ethical fashion shopping guide, seven steps to an ethical capsule, capsule wardrobe. That's great. Slow fashion. I, I okay. I'll put this link up too. Cause this is going to be a great resource yeah. for people. You know, one of the girl that did the um, seven um, steps, what is she, what is that blog title again? Seven, seven steps to an ethical capsule wardrobe. Yes. So that was written by Lauren. Um, she's the store manager at Raven and Lily. And she decided that she would narrow down her wardrobe to only key pieces and um, that was sustainable fashion. So that blog is super fascinating to see. And it was part of her working for this company and her reevaluating everything. I never tell anybody they have to do anything. So I always find it fascinating. Like of to what see happens. Me. Yes. Yeah. And so that was totally driven by her. And I was like, I want you to blog about this. This is amazing what you have accomplished. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm I highly recommend reading that blog because it's like very practical and inspiring. We there's a lot you know of kind of buzz about downsizing your wardrobe. The, mm -hmm. You know, so people have written stuff about having these capsule wardrobes, which I am completely fascinated by. Um, but I've never seen anything about you know downsizing with your wardrobe with only ethical, ethically made clothes. So this is great. Yes. Yeah. Yep. That was her whole thing. You know, we hosted the screening of The True Cost. Mm -hmm. It's a new documentary that came out a couple of weeks ago. It's going to be available on Netflix soon. But it's I would recommend people um, watching that movie. Um, it's going to be hard to watch. It's like Food, Inc. was, mm -hmm. you know, 10 mm -hmm. years ago. But the point of it is not to make you feel paralyzed or overwhelmed or guilty. It's, it's real. It, the point of it is for us to recognize that the only solution is when we as consumers rec recognize that we're the ones with the power to mm -hmm. make a change. And yeah. until we exercise our voice and are willing to take the time to support ethical companies, to research, you know, and find ones that we like, and there, there definitely are a lot out there is that's the only chance. And when we start to talk to the companies that we like to say, why aren't you doing this? Or like whenever I used to walk into anthropology, I would always say what's you know, made in the USA or fair trade. Mm -hmm. and slip pickings, but that was the only thing I would buy in the store, which is kind of hard to do. Right. But when you start to like ask those questions, they start to pay attention. And yeah. I'm not exaggerating. That is, that is why now you start to see and we experience big box companies coming to us because they recognize there's more of a consumer demand. So as it grows, I do think things will change because the consumer voice is the most powerful tool we have. That's amazing. So Raven and Lily, you have online and then you have a storefront here in Austin. Are the, where else yes. can you get your stuff? Well, we sell into over 300 stores. Okay, great. Um, so one of our, our biggest buyers is actually Magnolia Market, at Joanna Gaines from Fixer Upper. If I was you just watch there that the show, other day. Well, she wears Raven and Lily on almost every show. She's a big supporter of Raven and Lily awesome. and she's a friend and she um she sells it on her website as well. In August, she'll just have exclusive Raven Lily designs on her oh, that's website, great. and um, so you can get something. Not a, mostly it's just our website and hers. Not mm -hmm. a lot of other online yeah. resources, but otherwise, there's several boutiques all over the country. Oh, and then our our storefront here in Austin's the first. I hope to open more in uh, the next few years in other places. You have to stay tuned for that. We're actually moving into home decor and all kinds of things in the future. So, so fun. Someone fun. just emailed me the other day and said I should have Joanna on my show. Yeah, she's awesome. I don't well, even catch her. Well, I, <laughs> but then I was like, I'd have to admit to her that I've never seen her show. And then I would be like the only person in America that hasn't. You'd love her show because she and Chip have a really delightful relationship. So I think that's why the show's popular. I just would be like, I, I think I would be the worst host. I'd be like, so tell me, what do you do in life? <laughs> I have no clue who you are. That'd be so I, you awful. Have to watch the show first. That's I funny. know, I know. Well, I was meeting a girlfriend. We were going to doing a little staycation about an hour outside of Waco, and so we met there because she loves the show, and so she filled me in on everything. And I was like, okay, I got it. I can understand now. <laughs> I drove to Waco. My sister lives there the other day to see. 
her family and there's a big giant billboard of Chip and Joanna to welcome you as you enter Waco uh, area. It was pretty funny. That's hilarious. <laughs> They're like the literal poster poster couple of Waco now. <laughs> That's so funny. I'm so happy for them. That's so great. Yeah. It is. You know, I was thinking when you were telling your story about visiting everywhere you did in college and stuff. And I just think like hearing your background, which I never knew that before about your family and then seeing what you still accomplished in spite of the challenges that you had, it makes me think like, man, God was totally just moving in your life so Mm -hmm. much because that is not the common road that someone would go down with Mm -hmm. dealing with so much, um, trauma and stress and sadness and grief. Um, and everything that happened to you, you know, in college when your dad left and all that kind of stuff. And I'm just like, man, God had, he's so like gracious because he just knew that there was so much more to you than what the world was saying that you had. And I love that story so much. I'd never knew that. Yeah. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah. I feel, I feel grateful for God always being with me on this journey. I've, I've never, of everything that we've gone through, I've never felt a questioning of God, you, you know, any challenge because he's, he was so strong and present during that trauma yeah. in my heart and my mind mm-hmm. that I could never, ever, ever doubt his existence or presence. I may not understand something sometimes, but, but to, it just doesn't even fathom me because he was so, so, so strong and powerful mm-hmm. during those difficult times. So it's given me, yeah, a lot of courage. And honestly, Ryan's company has been a challenge. I didn't know how to be a CEO. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, it's been so hard. But I had a lot of mentors here in Austin that have been so gracious that are successful business people that have come alongside because they saw what I was doing. They, they believed in it. And I'm so grateful that they've given me their time and their experience to help me learn how to put on that CEO hat mm-hmm. to figure out how to do this. Cause I'm really, you know, I have more of a visionary yeah. and more of a creative person and more of a relational person, but there wasn't anybody else to run the company. And so sometimes that that's like been the hardest thing for me is to like play a role that's like new to me and, you know, to like, I'm going to Vegas and like a week with a, my director of operations to speak at South by Southwest conference in Vegas about social business. And I'm cracking up because I was like, why am I going to a South by Southwest business conference? Like, how did this happen? It's hilarious. <laughs> like what world do I live in? But if that, like, I do feel like I've had, you know, eight years of experience, uh-huh. like really figuring this out and almost like being on the forefront of seeing this movement happen yeah, because I sure. want to see it happen so much because I do think that one of the keys to alleviating poverty is to provide dignified opportunities for yeah. people to thrive. Mm-hmm. And I'm just part of like a big movement of all kinds of creative things evolving. And I love that, that it's been such a joy that it's, I do feel like as I've been going, I can, I've had to turn to God so many times and be like, okay, palms up. This company is in your hands. And if yeah. you want me to continue, you absolutely have to provide the resources of people. Cause I, I have no idea right. what to do next. And a hundred percent of the time he has delivered. So I'm very grateful. <laughs> so wonderful. Well, I, we talked about this and you'd like to give something away to a listener. Is this true? Yes, I would be happy to. So I wanted to give something away from our new fall collection. So it launches, um, you know, mid-August. Okay, and great. So the, the item that I was thinking would be something from our new partnership. We have a few pieces that came out in, uh, last spring, but the new pieces are really beautiful. They're recycled hammered brass jewelry pieces. Mm. And so there's some earrings that I love that come from this group. It employs a group of women from the Kibera slum, which is one of the largest slum areas in Kenya. And last summer I spent time with those women and they took me through every process of how they make this jewelry, which was super amazing because one woman is really skilled at the hammering. One woman's really skilled at the cutting. Uh-huh. One's really skill- skilled at the, um, uh, polishing and then one at putting it all the final pieces together. So every piece of jewelry that we sell has four to five women involved in some stage wow. of putting it together. And I tried the hammering and they told me I was doing it wrong. So that was pretty funny. But <laughs> I was like, like step aside. Practice. We got this. I was like, I'm doing it. And they like shook their heads and like had to fix the piece. I like, don't even know what it looks good to me. That's but so funny. They're that. like crazy Americans. They cannot do this. Yeah, but I, I, um, Years ago, we took our son to Kenya with us, and we um, did a camp for vulnerable children and, and orphans and AIDS children from the Kibera slum with our son Mason when he was eight. And so I have a real heart 
um, for that specific slum community. And every year since then, people from our church, we started with our Hollywood church, they go back. Mm-hmm. And some of them every single year. So they've built like these incredible, strong relationships there. So I'm really happy to be able to like have this new partnership in that same slum community supporting the women and the jewelry is gorgeous and people love it. So I would love to give away a pair of those earrings. That's great. And we'll do it on Instagram. I've done that before and it's super fun. So I'll just put all the information. I'll let you know how to do that at the end of this podcast. So, um, Kirsten, what are three things that you're loving right now? Oh, my alpacas. Yes. Laverne (laughs) and Shirley. I love them. Um, let's see. What else do I love? I am I'm loving this company in LA called Reformation. Mm-hmm. They're all they're one of the ethical companies that I buy from besides wearing Raven and Lily. So I think they have some really great designs. Okay. So I'm loving that. And I'm I'm loving my um, sunsets out of Green Acres every evening when I get to come home and just relax in a hammock and watch the sunsets. I know that sounds super cheesy, but it's the truth. That's not cheesy at all. That sounds lovely. (laughs) Oh, that's so beautiful. What are you reading right now? Well, are you a reader? Yes, I am. But it's so funny because I kind of go in waves. And so I just finished the book Malala. Um, I really like it. Yeah. I've been wanting to, it's on my list. So, it was interesting, and the reason I found that book really interesting is because one of our partnerships is in Pakistan. It's with Afghan refugees at the border in outside of Peshawar. And so the region her whole story is about is where the refugees are that I help employ, and I cannot mm. go visit them. So we've only been able to have the director come to us, and we're I'm trying to get a couple of the members of my team to go and visit. We've had a really hard time getting visas because it's literally in such a dangerous area. So that book was really amazing to me because on so many levels and reading her story, but specifically because that's where we're working. We're helping to employ mm. several hundred women there. And so it gave me such a visual and understanding to what's been going on there through her words. So I, I, I recommend the book. I thought it was fascinating. But um, but yeah, for me, it was it was on another level as well because of the women that we're advocating for it's there. It's personal, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, Kirsten, this has been so fun chatting with you. Thanks, Jamie. I love Pleasure. learning more about your company. Thank you. And more about where we can find out where we need to buy from, from the website that you gave us, bcorporation.net. That's going to be, I'm going to go look at that tonight when my kids are in bed. Nice. And check out the ethical fashion forum too. Cause yeah. all over the world, like we're kind of slow here in the States, but all over the world, this thing's been taking off for a while. So that'll, yeah, it's cool to, to see what's going on there. So, but and thanks I, for your time, Jamie. I yes, appreciate it. I, I love, love it. And I'm going to have to figure out when Aaron and I can come out to Green Acres. Please do soon. We'd love to have Yay. you. Okay. Thanks, Kirsten. Thank you. Take care. Guys, thanks so much for joining Kirsten and I for this episode of the Happy Hour. She was a fun guest to talk to. And tell me, you do not want to go out right now and get you a pet alpaca to bring home to your land. Or do you want to go visit Kirsten at Green Acres? Well, you can. I I told you, I'm going to put the link to the Airbnb for their place over on my website, jamieivy.com. And if you end up there, please tell them that you heard about it on the Happy Hour. They're personal friends of ours. And so I'm trying telling Aaron I want him to take me out there anyways. And I told you I was out there last week for a, a concert and it's just absolutely beautiful. I want to remind you guys about the survey. Go to jamieivy.com slash survey. Take a couple of minutes to fill it out. I promise you it will not be that long. It'll give you a good chance to win the $25 gift card to Amazon and it really helps out my show more than you can even understand. Guys, today's show is also sponsored by Nutty Snacks. Nutty Snacks are gluten-free, all-natural, high-protein, good-for-you fuel that tastes like dessert. Perfect for CrossFitters and endurance athletes who need a little boost to keep going. Loved by moms who need a quality snack for their little people. Devoured by anyone who dares to try them. They come in convenient two and a half ounce packs for life on the go. Or there's also the you should really share with other pack that's seven ounces that ensures your friends will stop by for another visit. Nutty Snacks is committed to doing good and making a difference in the world. When you purchase Nutty Snacks, a percentage of the proceeds goes directly to the Imani Project to help kids in need. Or you can do good through our Purchase for a Purchase Project, where we partner with other organizations committed to doing good in the world. Nutty Snacks. A little sweet, a little nutty, a whole lot of good. Guys, thanks so much for listening to this episode number 52 of the Happy Hour. I cannot wait to have you back next week for my friend Bailey Hurd. Bring some tissue with us because she's going to talk about journeying through the 10 months of her husband's cancer 
um, and his passing and what she's doing since then. I also have Sophie Hudson coming up for you, Jessica Honiger, Whitney Runyon, Logan Wolfram, Jillian Lauren. I mean, we have a lot of amazing guests coming up, and the happy hour just gets better and better every week. So, guys, thanks for listening. Enjoy this week, and go have a real happy hour with some of your girlfriends. Hey, coming on.